How was it, now that we're back, you were up there with uh, President Obama, 44. Before we talk about that, talk about the preparation. Well, you know, preparing to interview a president is, is not like anything else, right? So, um, because you do, you know, go through the questions, but that's not really what makes the interview. Mm -hmm. What makes the interview is the organic dialogue that you have between questions. You frame a question, he answers a question. He's very verbose, yeah. if you didn't notice yeah. that. Um, but the response, the feedback, the follow-up questions, that's what really makes the interview organic and authentic and gives the audience, I think, a really great um, experience. It's hard to prepare for that. That's what I was gonna say. Very hard to prepare, hard to prepare for, that. for that because you don't know what he's gonna say, mm -hmm. right? And you have to kind of read the audience a little bit and read the moment a little bit. So, you know, if it seems like it's a very energetic audience, you would probably ask the question differently than if it's a very kind of solemn type environment. Um, but what makes, I think, an interview like that compelling, because I'm not a journalist. I'm not there trying to catch him in a moment yeah. or, or, or get him to commit to some policy issue. I want to pick his brain. Mm -hmm. And I want to be able to have an organic dialogue, even if that means me disagreeing with him at some point. Because yeah. he said some things that I thought, mm, I don't totally agree with that. But you don't sit there and tell yeah. Barack <laughs> Obama, mm -hmm. you're wrong. Yeah. I don't agree with that at all. You say, well, let me share another point of view mm -hmm. with you, right? Um, I think these are little techniques that give uh, an audience or an interview with somebody like that um, more comfort. And I think for the audience, it works better. Um, and I think that applies to people in all different realms. Absolutely. If you're speaking to your CEO, for example, and you're an executive and you want to stand out or you want to show that you've got your own ideas and sometimes you want to express that you think the company may be going in the wrong direction, the way you deliver that comment makes all the difference in the world. Shows your maturity, shows whether or not you are a true candidate for the C-suite yourself, Yeah. right? And those little things, you know, they go a long way. So let's talk about delivery. What are some of the ways that you prepare on delivery that you recommend? Delivery? Yeah. Well, I mean, like I said, you want it to look organic, right? Mm -hmm. You have this conversation like this, right? And you have an audience that's out there. So you want to move between the president and the audience at times. You don't want to just lock yourself in yeah, here for 40 minutes. Yeah, because you acknowledge the crowd energy. <laughs> you look in the audience mm -hmm. sometimes, and sometimes you get some feedback from the audience a mm -hmm. little bit, and that influences your next question. Um, but people were there to see Barack Obama, make no mistake, yeah. right? So for me to try to talk over him or to, you know, spend too much time really giving my own opinions yeah. around things, I think would also have been very clunky. So you want to tee things up, let him say his piece because that's what people are there to, True. to see. And then kind of provide him a little feedback or mm -hmm. some context or a different perspective that, again, I think plays to a very good experience for the audience. Yep. But also, and here's the big sort of moonshot, might actually make an impression on him. True, right? true. He's still a very influential guy. Yeah, right. One of those right. influential people in the world. Yep. And for him to kind of get a little bit more about what we're talking about at NAREP and Latitude, it's a great opportunity. And you yeah. never know when he might reach back and use some of that. Yeah, that's true. You said read the audience at times. Yep. What, were you, what did you get from our attendees, our members in the stands? Well, you know, first of all, um, it was a very attentive audience. Yeah. You know, you didn't hear much no. talking. People were fixated in the conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, a president is actually, you know, one of a kind. You think that there are celebrities. Well, there are celebrities and there are A-list celebrities and then there's presidents. Yep. Because the president, we don't even realize, is so familiar to us. His voice, mm -hmm. his mannerisms, right? His style of speaking, his attire. It's like that is so ingrained in our head because we saw it every day yep. practically for eight yep. years. Mm -hmm. We don't even realize it. So when he's there in the flesh, it is a little surreal. And you can see the audience really sort of trying to process that. Yeah, I see that. I was one of them. <laughs> so where did you even come up with the audacity? You're from East L.A. You know, you're in the mortgage business. You're obviously not. 
Where did you have the audacity to say, I want to interview a president of the United States? Now, this is your third presidential interview, but where does that, when did that first, that fire <laughs> say, I can do this? Well, it's not, uh, it's not something that necessarily occurs overnight, right? It is a process. It's mm -hmm. a journey. Yeah. I mean, you can really make the case that I started with a mortgage brokerage with three people and somehow parlayed that into NAREP, Latitude, Latitude Ventures, yep. and all these different things, right? And I'm not the only one who's, you know, taken something small and turned it into something much bigger. You're one of the few Latinos to interview three presidents of the United States. Perhaps. So quit being humble. <laughs> Perhaps. I don't know. I, I've always thought in my mind that I need multiple things going on, right? Mm -hmm. So I have to have my business and I have to, you know, take care of my family, right? So I need to do that. I can't, I'm not the type of person that's willing to put it all on the line yeah. all the time. But I also have to have my moonshot, mm. right? Yeah, something has to inspire me not to just to get up in the morning, but to actually try to continue to achieve. Yeah. And, and, you know, to me, interviewing a president is kind of the ultimate, <laughs> yeah. right? Uh, and, and, you know, so when I sort of said, hey, let's invite Bill Clinton and see if we can get Bill Clinton to come to our event, and I'd like to have a dialogue with him, uh, it sounded like a long shot at the time, and it was. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, I think there's a lesson there to a certain degree. So that moonshot is what it is. You always have to have a moonshot, right? You always have to have a dream, Yeah. in my view, right? And certainly, certain people do. I'm wired that way, mm -hmm. right? But I'm not the type of person who, who, who is irresponsible with that, yeah. right? Who's always chasing pipe dreams. I think you have to have some find foundational business or thing going on, but simultaneously, you have to always be going after that moonshot. You, you teach us that at NARP all the time. But yeah. here's the thing, too. Here's a different thing, right? So people tend to follow the same dreams. Yeah. They all follow the same dreams. You know, I want to be a movie star. I want to be a billionaire. I want to be, you know, whatever. And, and those are dreams that I think a lot of people have, but they're not original, right? Mm -hmm. So for me also, the moonshot has to be something that is entirely original. That's what really inspires me, yeah. right? Not just, I want to make a lot of money someday. I want to be a billionaire. Yeah. I want to own my own jet, whatever the case may be. I'm not saying that I don't have some aspirations along those lines, but for me, it's always doing something that's never been done before. What point in your career did you start thinking like this? Because I remember one time you were like, if you want to be the food and beverage manager at NARF, I got bigger plans for you, right? Yeah. So at what point did you think, I have to be original, I have to have an attainable moonshot? Because most people get into an industry to work. I, I don't know. I think probably books that I read, mm. uh, people that I met along the way, the ones that impressed me the most weren't always the richest, mm -hmm. you know. Um, they weren't always um, famous, per se, uh, but they were trailblazers. Mm -hmm. Those are the people that fascinated me the most, you know, whether, like I said, whether it was just reading a magazine uh, article about somebody. Um, I just really am impressed with people who are able to make something out of nothing, to think in a way that other people typically don't think. It takes humility to think like that, though. Someone like you who's achieved and built so much to still learn from any place, any person, any anything, right? So does it take humility to think like that, to be open to learn? A hundred percent, a hundred percent. You know, there's a lot of very smart people who don't have that humility, yep. who don't realize you can learn from, you know, the person who sits at the front desk. True, um, true. And I think that humility does go a long way. Got it. So the approval process, it's not easy. You can't just DM somebody and say, hey, can you get the president of the United States, right? <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about that because for the culture, for other trades, for other business organizations, for other aspiring uh, Latinos out there, Talk to us a little bit about the approval process. Well, I what you can say. I may be wrong, but mm -hmm. I'm pretty confident that Barack Obama has never spoken at a real estate event before. Mm -hmm. um, he rarely speaks at conferences in general. Um, he does some, you know, private speeches around the world. Um, so, and this is not a guy who's looking for work, <laughs> yeah, per se. That's true. Right, uh, but I think that we have assets. I could not like. 15 years ago, have gotten a Barack Obama to come to our event, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So I think the platform that we built, the reputation that we built, some of the relationships that we acquired along the way, political, business relationships, the media and so forth, all of that gave us a lot to work with. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we are a unique organization, 
right? We are the largest Latino business organization in the United States. And when you come to a NARP event, you're going to see something and experience something that's very different than yep. what people are used to in that regard. So when you have something like that to work with, an asset, um, it does open doors. And you can't be afraid to call in favors, mm -hmm. you know, and to ask people to do something for you, especially people who are in a high position. Yeah. So, um, you know, for whatever reason, I've never been afraid to ask people, mm -hmm. um, you know, for help, uh, for advice, um, you know, for um, some degree of, you know, commitment. Um, and I think if you do that and you do it well and you have a real asset, you know, to, to, to be able to, you know, catapult you to a certain degree, I think you can do great things. Absolutely. That's the vetting process. Now let's talk, you got approved, then it's submission of questions, right? Because you didn't want to just <laughs> give them an assist or give anybody <clears throat> an assist because it's not, right? So, Yeah, I don't want to be critical here, but mm -hmm. there is a process. You have to send in questions in advance, uh -huh. and those questions have to be approved by his staff. I don't know how much Barack Obama's involved in that process. Maybe not at all, mm -hmm. uh, or maybe he is. I don't know. Um, but, you know, they they don't necessarily want him, want to put him in an uncomfortable situation. So they want to have questions that are, I think, uh, substantial, yeah. but not necessarily inflammatory to a certain degree, uh, if you know what I mean, yeah. right? They don't talk about real controversial stuff or yeah, stuff yeah. that's potentially going to embarrass him or put him in a bad spot. Um, and so, uh, but they also try to water down the questions, yeah. you know, and they try to, uh, they suggest that you ask a lot of, you know, personal questions about, you know, are you a better golfer now than a basketball player, stuff like that. Um, I think that's fun for the audience. I think that has to be part of it, but it can't be the core of yeah. the dialogue that you have. When you have a moment with the president, you want it to be. So the process is intensive. There's a lot of back and forth. I stood my ground on the questions around immigration, yeah. which were originally rejected, by mm -hmm. the way. Yeah. Um, and I explained to them the context of the event and the way we go about dealing with that issue. And I thought it would be disingenuous, not to mention the fact that immigration reform did not get done yeah. during his presidency. Well, at the same time, I did acknowledge on the stage that he got DACA done. Mm -hmm. And that did impact people in a lot of different positive ways. Um, but, uh, yeah, that process is, is thorough. And, you know, every, th every element mm -hmm. uh, involved, including who takes the photographs, including, yeah. Yeah. you know, who introduces us. to the, All of that has to be approved way in advance. Absolutely. Shout out to Danny Hastings. Um, I was a little worried there for a minute. We were. So, yeah. he, called, he called me. He's like, can you text Danny? <laughs> they asked me for the, can I, can you send me, is this the correct spelling <laughs> of Danny Hastings? <laughs> please, please, New York. I that shit, man. They're going to kick him out. <laughs> so you said something. You acknowledged that DACA got done, but immigration didn't get done. So that means you're not out there to just say, you didn't do this and, and, and just complain. That's great that you did that. Why is it important to not do where you're playing the blame game? <clears throat> well, I think that, first of all, you don't want to get him on the defense mm -hmm. in a situation like that, which is why the first thing I said was, I'd like to talk about immigration for a second. And I wanted to acknowledge, for the record, that DACA got done on your watch yep. and that it's impacted hundreds of thousands of people positively. And I want to thank you for that. And the crowd applauded, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So now that That's sort of sets the, the tone a little bit. But it was never intended to be a permanent solution. And he nodded his head. Yeah. I said, we've had a lot of trouble getting immigration reform done. We didn't get it done on, during your administration. In fact, we haven't gotten it done since Ronald Reagan was president in any significant way. Mm -hmm. And I think part of the problem is the fact that it's framed too frequently as a social policy issue. And we don't talk enough about the ec economic yep. reality that immigration reform plays for the well-being of our entire country. Yep. Right. So I think framing it that way helped, even though he did squint at me a little bit mm -hmm. when I said it didn't get done during your administration yeah. either. Um, but uh, I think it turned out to be fine. He got to say his piece. He talked a little bit about the challenges we've had with, uh, you know, Republicans, um, you know, and the way they've moved so harshly against immigration in recent years. Uh, but I think the, the I think it went well. I think the audience needed to hear that. You got him speaking. I've obviously, if you come to a Latino event, that's what I'm saying. Barack Obama comes to a Latino event, and immigration reform is not mentioned and not discussed. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it just seems like I mean, you know, 
Yeah. That's a, obviously a, a major omission. Yeah, that, absolutely. Uh, that just seems, you know, incomplete. You had him talking about Latino issues, even mentioning the word Latino in a different kind of conversation. <clears throat> you know, talks about relevance. He mentions Bad Bunny and reggaeton, you know. So are you feeling now at this point like, okay, this is, you've met someone like, okay, this guy is really working the crowd. He speaks eloquently. And you're, how was, what was your moment when he did that? Because that was the first time you were like, actually laughed out loud. <clears throat> there is a poem, there is a rhythm yes. that an interview uh, that you hope happens during an interview. You know, in the beginning, it's like a boxing match, right? You're kind of feeling each other out a mm -hmm. little bit. And then there's a rhythm that takes place when there's real chemistry up there. Yep. So the fact that he started to go down that path, that we had that really great moment talking about Mano Ginobili. Yes. And, uh, you know, I got to work in the fact that I played for Greg Popovich. Yes. Also, all of that was very organic. I think the audience may have even thought that that was scripted because it was like too perfect, right? And uh, But it just showed that we hit that rhythm and you really want to, you know, when you feel the rhythm, when you feel the momentum, and I've said this in my blogs, I've said this many times, that's when you have to double down, mm -hmm. right? Yes. And so so when he started to loosen up and really start to have fun up there, even when we were talking, that was a serious conversation. We were talking about the misinformation out there in the media, mm -hmm. and he started to, to, to have that conversation in a in a way that was more engaging and a little bit fun, um, that's when you know he's relaxed. Mm -hmm. That's when you know when he's having a good time up there, and then you want to double down on that, yep. right? And, and, really and right. not let that moment go away. Exactly. You did have a differences in opinion on the Latino vote. <clears throat> Talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, so, you know, I was talking um, about, I think it was, this was coming off of the heels of the immigration conversation, and Obama said something that, you know, I think this was his, his very, you know, classy way of pushing back on my, my statement that he didn't get immigration reform done, mm -hmm. right? And, and what he said was, Latinos have to get alignment around these issues yep. first. Mm -hmm. Because if Latinos aren't aligned on issues, they are never going to rise to the top of the priority list yep. of policymakers, essentially. I'm paraphrasing mm -hmm. what he said. But that's basically what he said. He's like, hey, it's not you too. It's not mm -hmm. just on mm -hmm. us, basically. And I responded, I think, in a way that I don't regret. But I will say that since we had that conversation, I started to reflect more on what he said, and I actually started to understand it more. What I responded with is I said, you also have to give Latinos something to vote for. And I think that there are issues that Latinos are aligned around. But I think, I said to him, I said, as a, as a moderate Democrat, I think the Democrats get wrong too often is they talk a little bit about us or to us about social issues, a little too much about immigration from a social issue standpoint, not enough about economic issues, not enough about economic prosperity, yeah. which at the end of the day is why most Latinos love this country or are in this country in the first place. Mm -hmm. It's the economic prosperity, opportunity to create a better life that drove us here in the first place, yep. not social issues. And so I don't, you know, so, so he didn't disagree with me because mm -hmm. when I said that the crowd actually, yeah. uh, actually applauded. Mm -hmm. And so he nodded his head and then he somehow tied it to the black community, which I thought was a little bit, um, you know, a little bit different than I yeah. expected. But anyways, you talked about looking back at that answer when he talked about immigration and the Latino vote and being aligned. Have you watched the interview since then? Honestly, I have uh, not. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, see, I watch my cooking videos all the time. You don't even watch your own interviews? So I have not watched any wow. of the three okay. presidential interviews, mm -hmm. uh, believe it or not. I should, yeah. uh, and I've seen clips of them, obviously, and sound bites, but I've never sat and watched them from beginning to end. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't know why, maybe because I was there. Yeah. And I kind of, <laughs> it's pretty clear in my head. Um, and maybe I would get even, you know, a little better at the interviews if I did, but uh, I haven't yet. Uh, okay. Did anything he say uh, throw you off from your preparation? <clears throat> well, I wouldn't say anything he said threw me off. I would say that when I looked at the clock 
and I saw that almost 20 minutes had passed and we were still on question number one. Yeah, he does. <laughs> <laughs> I said, I think that threw me off a bit and yeah. I thought, okay, so how do I get yeah. back yeah. into a rhythm? Because I don't want this interview to be two, two questions. I, I was illegally <laughs> filming, so I'm like, this is ruining my real stuff, man. <laughs> okay. So, but you have to roll with that. You, you do. Because I was not going to interrupt him. Mm -mm. Uh, no way. You know, I think some other people would have, yeah. um, but I was not going to do that. Yeah. If he wanted to take 20 minutes to answer a question, I had to roll with that. Yep. Um, and, and maybe I could frame the next question differently um, that wouldn't necessarily be so broad yep. to where he had to feel like he had to answer it from a 360 degree standpoint. Uh, and maybe that's what I was thinking in my head at the time. But yeah, that was the one thing that I thought. I, I literally looked out on the clock and it said 42 minutes. And yeah. I thought, we're still in question number one. <laughs> exactly. I do remember that moment. Um, one of the many things you know leaders have is that passion for family. How was it afterwards, the feedback from your family? Well, it, I mean, it's a great um, privilege and mm -hmm. opportunity. In fact, um, Immediately before the interview, when we were backstage, um, I had Aaron back there with me. Mm -hmm. And I just wanted to give Aaron that moment to talk to Barack about basketball. <laughs> just about basketball. And they had uh, a conversation. He asked about Point Loma and asked about his game. And, you know, they had their moment about, you know, just, uh, you know, basketball in general. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Obama loves basketball. Yep. And he's very knowledge knowledgeable when it comes to basketball. So they had a great, you know, three-minute conversation about basketball, which is, you know, I'll remember forever. Yeah. Your dad. <laughs> I wasn't having your dad there. Well, let me say that my dad uh, drove a train mm -hmm. oh. uh, from L.A. Uh, to, to make it. He came with his high school best friend, his best friend See, from high school. There you go. They reconnected, I don't know, 30 years later. They became golf buddies. Uh, he is a former police officer, LAPD. Uh, uh, black, mm -hmm. African American, um, and um, I told my dad. I said, "Do you want to see the interview? I, I you know, I'd love for you to come and see the interview." <laughs> cool. He says, "No, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Can I bring Rodney?" And I said, <laughs> "Yeah, you can bring Rodney." What I didn't tell my dad was that I got him and Rodney approved for the photo line to take a photograph with oh, President Oh man! Barack so Obama. even then, you're child. I love this. <laughs> I didn't yeah. tell him. I That's told so my dad cool. the day before. Just because I didn't, I didn't want him to, yeah. <laughs> not to know that, yeah. uh, but uh, he chose not to tell his best friend at all mm -hmm. until they were there. Yep, and uh, that was really cool Special to be moment. able to do that for my dad. You know, I just you know I can't uh, I can't put it into words no, entirely, I but I will tell you that right after they had finished the photo line, I, I was waiting for them and they came there, and I you know talked to Rodney, asked him how it was. <laughs> He didn't answer me, <laughs> and my well, dad and my people's lives. my dad goes, he's still in shock here. Yeah, <laughs> no, the Arizona Compass team, the Veritas team, they were still in shock. You know. Yeah. So let's let's um, the Manu moment. So Popovich reached out to you. He did. You know, and, and tell me a little bit. Why do you think that happened? <laughs> well, obviously, uh, it happened because Manu went mm -hmm. back to him and said, "Hey, do you remember Gary Acosta?" And it turns out Popovich remembered me very well. Yeah. And, uh, you know, actually told Manu a couple of things about me. And, um, and that was very cool. So Manu Ginobili, getting him to the event was a big deal. Mm -hmm. This is the first Latino who is in the Basketball Hall of Fame. First one. Yeah. Incredible, yeah. right? And it just happened a couple of weeks before mm -hmm. the conference, right? And so fortunately, we have some mutual friends who was able to reach out to him. I got a chance to speak with him in a Zoom call about a month before the event. I told him about it, you know, I shared with him some links. He said, I, I gotta see this, I'm in, yeah. count me in, whatever. Very, very humble guy, you know, did not ask for anything, did not ask for, you know, uh, didn't provide us with He you would know, ask a list. us for the agenda, the breakout sessions. Yeah, he no, was, he was, he was more interested in the business sessions yeah, yeah. than he was in the Bas basketball classic, which is what 100%. we invited him for. Um, and he did. And uh, so, anyways, so obviously Manu being there and really seeing him become inspired by the yep. quality of the event and the participants who showed up at the event, people who he looks up to, like Lin-Manuel Miranda and mm -hmm. stuff like that, that he told me, he's like, he's one of my idols. Mm -hmm. You know, um, that made a huge impression on him. Got so it. he went back, because you know he's on the staff for the Spurs, mm -hmm. and uh, told uh, Pop, you know, he's like, 
Gary Acosta says he played for you and blah, 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 blah. <laughs> And so Pop sent me a note yeah. and, and asked me for my cell phone. And so, anyways. What were, so what were a couple of things he said about you? <laughs> <laughs> you got to get those out, bro. You got to get those out, man. <laughs> so, so he said two things. He says, I, so when I saw Manu at the gala, mm -hmm. he said, I talked to Pop this morning. Mm -hmm. And I said Gary Acosta. And he said, what the F <laughs> is Gary Acosta doing? <laughs> and Manu told him. And he told Manu, he says, I remember two things about Gary. He said, number one, he spoke Spanish worse than any other Mexican I'd ever met. <laughs> and secondly, he had a good jump shot. There you go, <laughs> man. So Coach Pop, Coach Pop, we look forward to seeing you at one of our events, man. It'd be an honor, Coach. Uh, let's talk some serious stuff, Gary. There was some resistance from some of our members when we announced that you were going to have President Obama. Yeah. How did you handle that? Well, politics is, you know, difficult right yep. now. You know, it's a very polarizing environment. Um, there's not the kind of, I think, intellectual debate that maybe there once was between, you know, the two parties. Uh, it's all about demonization. Um, you're a bad guy. You hate America. These people are trying to destroy our country. It kind of goes both ways. And um, so anytime you bring a political figure, especially one as significant as a mm -hmm. former president, you're going to have people who are going to basically be put off by that. Uh, Narup is now leaning left and, you know, this guy, you know, did his policies, you know, made the country worse and all this kind of stuff. Um, so you look at things from a basically risk reward standpoint, yep. right? So there is risk and you try to manage that risk, but you look at is the reward greater than what the risk potentially poses. And I didn't just make that decision on my own. Yeah. As you know, I discussed it with our board. Yep. I got a chance to, for everybody to weigh in on that. I actually reached out to people outside of our board as well, just to get their feedback, to share with them from my point of view yep. why it was important, but not try to um, influence them too much, because yeah. I, I kind of wanted the feedback. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, the reward of having somebody like Barack Obama at the conference you know, just greatly outweighs any risk. If you remember, you know, we had Lynn manuel Miranda, we had CEOs of Nike, we had, you know, other celebrities at the event. Five o'clock in the morning, people were lining up for the Obama interview. Yes. That was Five o'clock in the morning. There were 3,000 people in line for 1,800 seats. Yeah, I woke up to like 200 DMs. And, so uh, this isn't a know, nightclub, people. So I think that validated that we made the right choice. 100%. There's no question the reward outweighed any risk. So third president, what does that do for NAR, the organization? I think that hopefully, hopefully, and I think it's true for the most part. I think people now view NARP as not just another minority real estate trade association, mm -hmm. right? Not that there's anything wrong than that. Than, uh, not that there's anything wrong with that, right? But as you know, we've tried to become more than that. Yep. Um, we want to be a great Latino business organization but we also want to inspire people from a cultural standpoint. We want people to think bigger. We want people to imagine things uh, in ways that maybe they wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. We've never had anything like that within mm -hmm. the Latino community. We've never had a platform like this where we can showcase the best and the brightest that we have in all these different sectors and give people uh, a great experience and have a great time and be able to meet yeah. people in the foyer yep. that they wouldn't have been able to meet otherwise. So um, I hope that people start to see NARAP as this anomaly, as this phenomena of sorts, because I think that's exactly what we are. Yeah, no doubt. It definitely impacted everybody. I hadn't seen that, you know. Um, looking back now, rethinking everything, is there a question you wish you could have asked that you didn't? <sighs> you know, um, I felt pretty good after the interview, uh, mostly because I felt I was in the moment, yep. right? That I wasn't just speaking from a script, um, that there was real chemistry on stage, um, and that I was present, that I was listening to his answers as well, and processing those answers, and then utilizing those answers to provide some feedback or some commentary. So from that standpoint, I think it went about as well as it could have went. Um, 
I think I would have liked to have more conversations about what NARP is all about. Yeah. You know, um, and gotten his his feedback on that. Mm -hmm. Talk a little bit about the stuff that we do, the programs we do, the initiatives we pursue, and how that might compare to other things that he's seen in the past, and what he might have in the way of opinions around those things. I, you know, I, I wanted it to be a broader conversation and not a narrow conversation, yeah. but I do regret that I didn't get a chance to talk more about that. Yeah, it's not easy. You're dealing with the President of the United States. Right? Yeah. It's not yeah. like a CEO. Um, what did you want to get out of this interview with 44. What did you want him to get out of it? So I wanted him to see um, Latinos maybe in a different light than he has in the past. And obviously, President of the United States has probably seen things that 50 lifetimes, you know, wouldn't have the opportunity to see. But I think he has in his mind what a Latino organization looks like, mm -hmm. right? And it's probably more civil rightsy. Yep. than what NARAP and Latitude is. Uh, maybe uh, a little bit more partisan, mm -hmm. um, and maybe less, and I say this with all due respect, less professional. I mean, if you walk into a Latitude event, yeah. you see this is a world-class production. 100%. Not just you know some cool people yeah. on stage. It's a world-class production. So I wanted him to see that because I truly believe that he has probably never seen anything like that before. Got it. And if that had an impression on him, and the next time he's in a conversation <clears throat> or having uh, you know, a strategy meeting uh, about anything, and Latinos, business, the economy comes up, I hope he thinks about us. Absolutely. You've been an advocate for that for years. Remember the conversation you had with Howard Schultz? Yeah. Right? You were talking that, and what was his response when you gave he him? He said that. He said, I've never heard it framed that way before. Exactly. And can I use that talking point? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and I told him you could. Yeah. yeah. Can I use that talking point? I'm going to be on Barbara Walters. <laughs> very hash. Uh, so third presidential interview, give me one word that describes each one. So let's start off with Clinton. Very measured. Got it. So the conversation was very, you know, it was hard to break through and really get him to relax. He was very, he's a very political guy and he's very cognizant of his words um, and the impact that they have. So he measures those words very, very carefully. George Bush. Casual, friendly, um, very engaging, almost like he doesn't want to talk about anything serious, <laughs> wants to just go up there and have fun. Yep. He would, I would, you know, ask serious questions. But he would find a way to make every answer, you know, a little bit fun. Got it. Um, and uh, so the, almost the opposite of Clinton mm -hmm. in that regard. 44. <laughs> very, very polished. Um, one of the few people in the world that can really, I think, talk to people in almost every quality of life from the highest level of the geopolitical world to the most sophisticated business and science conversations, down to, and I don't say down to, over to hip hop culture, mm -hmm. entertainment, yeah. sports, yep. just those very subtle nuances, style, fashion, right? So when you're talking to somebody like that, you know, it's very hard to have a conversation where you feel like you're showing him something or teaching something that he doesn't already know or hasn't already seen. Very, very tough in that regard. I like that. Um, and, um, but I think somehow we found a way to find a great rhythm in the conversation. So it was my favorite one of the Masterpiece. Three. Give me your three favorite cities. <laughs> three favorite cities? Yeah. Uh, in the world or yeah. in the US? US. Um, that's actually, so I'm not, gonna, I'm not gonna say San Diego because it's where no, I live, I don't count, right? Yeah. So I would say definitely New York City. Um, probably Miami. Okay. Um, and then I would say probably uh, Las Vegas. Okay, so mostly because of the food. Which <laughs> which president would you like to go to NYC with? W would it be cool to be in New York with? And what would you be eating? Not the restaurant because they haven't paid us. No, I'm just kidding. But what president would you say? Let's go to New York. You got to try this dish. Which president? 
Well, definitely not George W. Bush for New York City. <laughs> and I don't mean that in any yeah. way. I just can't picture him <laughs> hanging yeah. and chilling in New York City. So I would probably say that, uh, first of all, I'd rather go to all three cities with Barack Obama. But if I had to pick that way, yeah, I would say it. New York City, probably Bill Clinton, Miami, Barack Obama, and then Las Vegas. I think I could have a good time with George W. in Las Vegas. There you go. <laughs> we can't take Danny Hastings and Omar everywhere. So that's why I said which cities, man. No, it's, it's been an honor. And looking back, I can't wait till we watch that interview again. You know? So all right, thank man. You. Thank you.